executive director of the IBA in Karachi uh, in 2020. Dr. Zaidi served as professor at Columbia University in New York and held a joint position at the School of International and uh, Public Affairs and uh, at the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies from 2010 to 2020 uh, when he joined the IBA in Karachi, which by the way is uh, one of the premier institutions of higher education in the country. Uh, his name has been associated with many renowned organizations. Um, in addition to Columbia, uh, he has also been associated with Johns Hopkins University, the University of Oxford, uh, uh, United Nations Development Program, the World Bank, and so on. He has written over 80 academic articles in international journals and as chapters and books, and has a number of books, including Military, Civil Society, and Democratization of Pakistan, which came out in 2011, The New De Development Paradigm, Papers on Institutions, NGOs, Gender and Local Government, and Pakistan's Economic and Social Development, the Domestic, Regional, and Global Context, and a number of others, which if I were to list, we will be here for a very long time. So I'm going to proceed, since I've delayed you for so long. Today, he's going to be telling us something about his latest work, uh, his book, uh, called Making a Muslim, Reading Publics and Contesting Identities in 19th Century North India. You, of course, have a description of that book in the advertisement that was sent out, but very briefly, um, it, the description states that Muslims in colonial North India, in the region known as Hindustan, have been examined and analyzed in anachronistic and teleological terms with the now familiar separatism to partition story that dominates. Many scholars have subscribed to this formulation without having examined the sources in Urdu and are from Muslims themselves. This book de-emphasizes both the colonial archive and its particular narrative, as well as the familiar voices of the dominant discourse, both in terms of great men and in terms of dominant institutions, and it allows us to rethink notions of the Muslim in its numerous complex and often contradictory forms, which emerged in colonial North India after 1857. He has been invited by the Center of Middle Eastern Studies, where we are right now, co-sponsored by the Institute for South Asian Studies and Stanford University. And his presence here is especially important to me and my uh, uh, students here and uh, the colleagues joining us today, because we're very interested in a transregional conversation about the formation of Muslim identity in the period that he covers in his book. So without much ado then, and with many thanks, uh, Dr. Zaidi. Uh, thank you very much, Asad. Um, hello, everybody on online here. I'd like to thank uh, Asad, not just for inviting me to, to Berkeley, but also because uh, because of him, I had to read my book, which I haven't read for the last two years since I gave the proofs and did the index. So I've, so I've not finally figured out what I've written. And uh, sometimes it reads very well. Uh, and as you know, that once, sometimes when we read our own book, I actually never read what I've written once it's published because I think you know it's best to put that aside and move ahead. So, so because of you, I had to read it, and uh, I think this, I learned a few things about uh, ideas that I'm going to talk about. So, as you said, and, and uh, as you said in your email earlier, um, I'm more interested in in a conversation rather than saying what the book is about. I think anyone who wants to really know what the book is about will either read a, a, a chapter or the introduction or, or, or look at it at greater length. But I'm uh, I, coming from Karachi and, and uh, teaching and working there, it's very seldom that we get the opportunity to talk to scholars who come from different disciplines, uh, who look at Muslims or Islam or this, the, the, the sort of the, the post-colonial, early colonial moment in, in history. Uh, so that's something that I'm particularly looking forward to a conversation with you and your scholars. I know a little bit of your work. Uh, it's too difficult for me to understand all of it, but a little bit of what you're working on and some of your students, some of my students are here as well, at least one of them. So I look forward to a conversation. So this book, uh, sort of, it, it came about very sort of strangely and I don't want to give a personal history of why I started writing this. But there are, but, but I was, uh, once I started, I, as you said in, in that introduction, uh, which I need to change, it's, it's, it's too old fashioned, uh, that my work has been in political economy and economics. And then 
once I started thinking about historical development and I said, you know, after doing economics for 40 years, I said, I better get an education and do a degree in history. And that's what this has been. This has been an education trying to understand um, how, you know, so the book is largely about what I would call the Muslim condition, the Muslim condition after 1858 in a particular region of India, which we call Hindustan, which is largely the Urdu speaking area, <clears throat> which uh, today we could call UP, parts of Bihar in India, uh, a little bit of the Punjab, but basically Northern India, Hindustan. So it, it, it tries to examine and explain what, who a Muslim was, how this concept, this notion, this idea, an identity or many identities of the Muslim emerged after 1858, uh, 1857, which for anyone who knows anything about imperial history, South Asian history, knows that that was in some ways a very important development, if nothing else, a complete transformation of what happened in South Asia. So my, so one of the things that about, so one, of the, one particular thing about this book is that it's not what one would call a uni, uh, sort of a linear history in the sense that, okay, in, certain events took place and the consequences of this and then that happened and that happened. It's not a historian's history of, of a particular type. And I know that there are some uh, historians who've, who've given me comments on this and they said, well, you know, it doesn't tell the story that a historian should be telling. Maybe because I'm not a historian, because I'm a political economist and now I've sort of thought about history and looked at some of the literature, maybe that's the reason. But for me, uh, what what What's more interesting is try to look at different strands, different ideas, different themes that were emerging at a particular moment, 50 years from about 1850 to 1900, and then to try to tie them together and get a sense of what was happening in terms of a Muslim or many Muslim identities which were emerging in North India. I think that's how I would sort of broadly summarize it. I think you did a very good job summarizing uh, it as well, but it's looking at uh, the, the idea and the notion of what constituted Muslim identities in North India under colonialism after 1858, 1857, 1858. Um, as anyone who's looked at South Asia would know, and especially those who look at South Asian history, they know that you know there's a very well-established conclusion drawn about North Indian Muslims uh, in the latter half of the 19th century. And I tried to look at that conclusion very differently. I think one of the, uh, the, the departures I make is that I look almost exclusively or very extensively on Urdu texts. Uh, if you look at scholars who work previously, um, not many of them work on say Urdu texts or texts in, in languages in uh, by people who are not very well known. And the colonial uh, archive uh, has in many ways informed uh, us about post-1857 events and the, the creation of a Muslim community. So I uh, so there's a there's a dominant narrative uh, in this literature which talks about the consolidation of communal solidarity among Muslims in colonial India. So there's, in a sense, a notion which is often used is the qom, which is, call it community, some people call it nation, uh, call it a broader identity of North Indian Muslims. So that's something that is, uh, that's been repeated in much of the literature that that, that has uh, been produced about North Indian Muslims after 1857. Uh, this dominant narrative assumes that, you know, there's a sense of community uh, being formed uh, after that. And there's a sense of coalescing together of Muslims, uh, especially when we talk about the Ashraf, which is the elite, and they, they get together and they, there's a sense of uh, a path forward in some ways. It's, that's why I call it very anachronistic and uh, you know, sort of difficult to understand. I think uh, a lot of the scholarship which has uh, existed about North Indian Muslims looks at 1947 and then works its, itself backwards. And I think there's, there's an end line to what is going to happen. We know the end. 
Therefore, let's, let's write our story according to the end. So what I try to do is forget about the end. I don't even know where the end is. And I say, let's just stay in the 19th century. Let's stay in the present and try to examine without uh, an end, without knowing where this goes to. And I think that's where uh, much of the difference lies. Uh, one thing is looking at uh, Urdu scholarship, Urdu writings, which is which are very extensive. They're not only religious writings, you know, because if you look at some scholars, they say most of the writing was religious. But if you start looking at other types of writing, it's not only religious. It goes into what one would today call cultural writing or uh, writing about society, about different things, and not and you know. I won't use the word secular, but I'll use it more sort of a, a broader notion of identity in terms of a North Indian identity where Urdu uh, uh, is written, spoken, and read. So my areas of um, research to start with are very different. And I think that also gives rise to different types of uh, conclusion. I think that's something very important for people who do history. And I think uh, much of the literature which emerged uh, in, the, in the 1980s and 1990s uh, from scholars, especially in the West, uh, came from a very different school. We know that history writing is history, the, the discipline has changed completely. I mean, scholars, students who are doing history today can't know, need to know at least two or three languages. Uh, before they can even start thinking about their topic. And I think that didn't happen uh, three or four decades ago. And I think that's new change that's taken place. Um, so some ways, you, know, you can ask the question, what does it matter? Why does it, why is a, this, this period important? Um, and I think I, I, I go back to something that Barbara Metcalf uh, said many decades ago. And she said, you know, how does one explain uh, the rise of what we call today sectarian uh, Sunni Islam movements in, in North India, uh, Maslaks or Firkas, as we call them in Urdu. Why, why does this happen? Why? And, and she says that, uh, she argues that perhaps it happens because of a sense of a political loss. We know that there's certainly a sense of, a real sense of political loss after 1857, although that political loss started many decades earlier, but the realization, the formal uh, sort of form of that takes place after 1857, after the British take over. And she makes this argument that perhaps, you know, because of political loss, there is a, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, it gives rise to numerous uh, Islamic movements uh, and also non-islamic movements like the Ali, not like the Alikar college and other colleges which 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 emerge after that time so there's there's something that happens after 1857 which gives rise to these developments amongst uh, the the ashraf the well to do muslims and they 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 rethink their sense of being their sense of worth and their sense of who they are and that's where this making a muslim comes into it what type of muslim or who who, 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 who creates this notion of a Muslim? So I, I, I begin by this, this question that who is a Muslim? Uh, who, who says uh, that a certain individual or group or community or family uh, is a Muslim? And I look at how the colonial archive and the colonial uh, census starts framing this question of and, and imposing categories of the Muslim on, on people who may not have known who, that they were Muslims. I mean, it, it's this whole idea of how one constitutes being a Muslim, even self-consciously is something that, that if you read the literature uh, and if you read the census literature as well, you get a sense of that, you know, people don't know that they are Muslims in the way that they are told that they are Muslims. And this, but they are told that they are Muslims and they have to, uh, by the British certainly, that they have to uh, sort of subscribe to that notion of, of being a, a Muslim. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, the the census, and, and, and one chapter deals with in detail of the colonial census, and I think one of the things that's also interesting is that there's been a lot of very good literature on the census in British India, but very little on Muslims in British India and the census. I think that's where a gap which I try to fulfill, uh, to, to fill, uh, because you know there's 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 work by uh, Nick Turks, by others uh, from Nick Turks from this university and others who worked on. The colonial census and uh, I think Barrier uh, did some work and lots of other people have done work on the colonial census but largely looking at 
Hindus and others uh, in the Indian context, but not enough on, uh, on Muslims. I think Mushir al-Hassan did some work, uh, but much later in the 20th century. So when I went back and started looking at the, the 1860s, 70s, and 80s of how the British framed what a Muslim was, uh, it, it was very surprising that a lot of individuals who were called Muslims didn't recognize that they happened to be Muslim because you get a lot of uh, very, very light and dark gray areas of, of, of religious belief, if one can even call it religious belief or religious practices. You get a sense of multiple practices which belong to different religions, which belong to different uh, you know, uh, faiths. And still, people may, may consider themselves to be a Muslim, but have acquired syncretic uh, different types of uh, practices from different religions. Yet the British ensured that they become Muslims because they felt, and the question was that if they do not fulfill certain characteristics which belong to Hindus, they happen to be Muslim. So it, they were forced into this category of being a Muslim. So that's how the British went about defining Muslims and creating Muslims. <clears throat> but it's interesting how the Muslims themselves, they rejected many of these categories. They felt that they don't belong to this nomenclature which the British had given them. And I think one of the most interesting uh, aspects of this was being called a Wahhabi. Uh, and the Indian Wahhabi is very different from what the Wahhabis have been called from Saudi, Saudi Arabia, from Arabia and so on and so forth. So this notion of how many uh, Muslims who belong to what is called the Ali Hadith, for example, refused to be categorized as Wahhabi because they felt that uh, for the British, the Wahhabi was a particularly seditious, uh, had seditious connotations. And uh, so many of those uh, Muslims who, who may have considered themselves to be from uh, the, what we call today the Salafists or fundamentalists or whatever terms we, we use for them, did not consider themselves to belong to uh, this, this definition of the Wahhabi, while the British imposed that definition on them and numerous other definitions. So I look at how uh, there was this contestation taking place and how Muslims started defining themselves completely besides and apart from how the colonial enterprise wanted them to define them. For them, it was very simple. There were three or four categories of Muslims, that's about it. Uh, and, uh, but, but amongst the Muslims, there were many other categories which were, which were not even clearly articulated. So that was one, one key area which, which emerges uh, in, in this research. The other is this, this sense of, uh, you know, uh, which, is very, which is very much part of the research that has been done by contemporary scholars of what happens after 1857. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, this, the, the terms that have been used by scholars, and I'll just, I'll keep, I, I, I'll tell you, I, I'll just quote a few, the, the tropes that are used uh, uh, and uh, how Muslims were affected. They say there was shock, traumatic shock, nostalgia, cultural trauma, collective trauma, grief, mourning, collective mourning, lamentation, a deep psychological wound. This is all 1857. Uh, the debacle, devastation, their most devastating trauma in centuries, a feeling of hopelessness uh, and, and similar themes. I mean, if you read a lot of uh, scholars who write about 1857, they'll, they'll use these terms. And this was the most devastating uh, thing that had ever happened to Muslims. I take a slightly different view. I said, okay, perhaps, there, of course, we know that 1857 did happen. And we know that there was loss of even presumed, subsumed, even a sort of a symbolic sense of authority and power. But I use a word which perhaps some those who speak Urdu would understand, zillat, which, which I translate as utter humiliation. There was, I, I use, I, looking at the literature of that period, I see this word being used a great deal, where uh, Muslims writing in Urdu, and not just the well-known Muslims, but you know, the other second tier scholars writing about their sense of, you know, the, of humiliation. And one of the, arguments that I take, and this is very speculative, one of the arguments that I make is that perhaps it was the sense of utter humiliation which gave rise to multiple uh, movements, renewal, revival taking place. There was a sense of loss, there was a sense of complete uh, you know, deprivation, loss of any sort of uh, sovereignty. Uh, the Mughal emperor, whenever he, where he existed, although he had no power, no, no authority, but there was a sense, he was a symbolic leader. And after 1857, we find a complete disruption in the old order taking place. And 
this is where I make an argument uh, that it was the, this idea of humiliation acts as an agentive force that it gives rise to Muslims start making themselves think about themselves. You know, why is it that uh, they've lost their sovereignty, lost their power? And what happens is that there is uh, a replacement of the Mughal uh, sovereign by the ulema, for example. Uh, and they emerge as uh, political agents, uh, perhaps not even knowing that they're political agents, but in a sense that we see the, we see the development of different types of uh, Maslax, uh, firkas in North India, all in a very small area in, you know, Deoband, Bareilly, uh, in that area. And uh, I argue, I think Sherali Tareen also in his book makes a similar argument where these, uh, this notion of political sovereignty emerges because, the, you know, the Muslims have lost a sense of identity with a leader, with somebody who, who they can find some sort of symbolic uh, reference to, and we see the rise of these uh, these Muslims taking place, and they substitute, uh, perhaps in a very very earlier form, as a community of many communities where uh, they have leadership, they have authority, they have uh, uh, some sort of understanding of of practices and belief and systems. So, so the, the role of the ulema changes very very markedly after 1857. Before that, they may have been advisors to the royal court, they may have been you know, people who may have been jurists, but uh, after 1857, we see as the colonial enterprise takes over, you have, uh, uh, you have sort of within that, you have these, uh, these, these uh, firkas emerging, which give a sense of the lost sense of community, a lost sense of identity. Um, then what I do is one of the most important parts of uh, how I'm thinking about these things is the print medium. Uh, you know, we've got your, you know, uh, imagined communities and, and, and other sorts uh, of identities which emerge through print. I, I look at print before it even becomes an imagined community. And there's, there's a very vibrant uh, print culture in, in Hindustan and in North India, which I think uh, some scholars have not looked at in, in detail. In fact, if you look at some of the, the scholars uh, from the 1970s and 1980s who looked at uh, the debates that take place, they, they talk about something called pamphlet wars, the, the exchanges that take place between different Muslims. But even prior to the Muslims being formed, you find a very strong uh, sort of sense of, of writing, reading, communication, debate, amongst those who wrote in Urdu. I mean, you have people like Ghalib writing about you know, a, 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 a Persian encyclopedia uh, uh, because he was bored. It was literally that he said he had nothing to do. So he said, okay, I'm going to start giving comments on an encyclopedia, which, which created a, a great deal of uh, problems for him because people said he doesn't know the, the right sort of Persian. So th th there's, a, there's a very large uh, sort of vibrant community, which is not necessarily talking about religious identity only is talking about very you know mundane things very sort of quotidian things uh, you have newspapers which are writing about uh, which are what one would call very inclusive today in the sense that hindu muslim uh, religious uh, festivals are being celebrated whether it's diwali whether it's eid whether it's ramzan whether it's uh, christmas whether it's new year's you know, all those uh, in, in the urdu press a very lively urdu press which is often uh, sort of oblivious to what's happening at, at, uh, at, a, a, at a more quote unquote national level or at a level where the colonial enterprise is involved. I and mean, they sort of sidestep the entire debate about coloniality and they, 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 they create subcultures within, uh, between and amongst themselves. Uh, one, another thing that I look at is that, you know, much of the writing that has taken place and the, the formation of a Muslim identity in 19th century India is based on the writings of three or four very well-known uh, men, Sir Sayyid, uh, Hali, uh, Shibli Nomani, uh, and you know, uh, largely, largely three or four people. Uh, what I try to do is to look at those writers who don't necessarily engage with this sense, uh, with these very well-known writers. And that gives a very different um, sense of what the, the Muslim, 
Urdu speaking, Urdu reading, Urdu writing community is as well. Uh, a lot of these writers don't engage with Sir Sayyid, they don't engage with Hali, and they're talking about you know, diff different issues, very lo local issues. Uh, a lot of scholars uh, have, have argued that by sometime in the 1870s or 1880s, a notion of a Muslim community had emerged, and they, they think that's the beginning of some the, it's a communitarian identity which leads to separatism, which leads to uh, partition and, and henceforth. I don't see that happening. I see debates of a very different nature taking place. And I think that's it's also very important for those of us who, who look at history, who do history, who look at texts, to be careful of which texts we're looking at. If you looked at Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan's, or if you looked at Hali's, or if you looked at any of those great men writing at that time, there are very few women, which is very unfortunate. I think there's a major gap in our knowledge, because uh, you know it's it's not easy to find women writers. Uh, of course, they do exist, but it's not very easy to find them. CM Naim has a new book coming out on Bibi Ashraf, who wrote in the uh, I think 1850s. Uh, but other than that, it's very difficult to find uh, work by women. So these great men are in some ways creating or forging a sense of a Muslim identity, which contemporary scholars have taken as uh, you know, uh, the formative way of looking at Muslim identity in the 19th century. And I, I think that's a huge gap in our understanding because um, this has led to themes like uh, the idea of a territorial nationalism. One scholar has called the Muslim community already in the 1870s and 80s having a sense of territorial nationalism. I don't find that, uh, except in the writing of Sir Sayyid and the Aligarh school, which comes a little later. So if you want to if you want to look at the Aligarh school and you look, want to look at Sir Sayyid, you're bound to find territorial nationalism. You're bound to find something called the, the two nation theory, which will help you explain a lot of other things. But that's perhaps an insufficient reading of what exists as uh, the literature on South Asian Muslims, uh, in, in Hindustani Muslims. Um, then in the, in, in, the, in the last part of the book, I look at this relationship between the oral and the written word. Uh, how uh, the manazara or the majlis uh, is, is a very powerful medium for identities to be forged. The, the manazaras usually take place between Muslim scholars and Hindus and Christians, uh, sometimes between Shia and Sunni as well, but often between other uh, religions. And the point is not uh, to, to convert anybody, but it's in, in a sense to, to create a myth, uh, to create a sense of uh, belonging to those who are present. Uh, there are there are supposed to be lectures which take place. There's supposed to be the manazras which take place, which have reportedly 25,000 people. I don't know what 25,000 people means at a time when you can hardly hear anybody in the, the fifth row or so, but this has been uh, documented by scholars of that time as well, by newspapers as well, that there were 10,000 people, 25,000 people. Now that is an extraordinary number. I mean, it's difficult to fathom even today what 25,000 people would be in, in, a, in, a, in a lecture or a discourse. These religious debates are uh, very familiar to all of those who study Islamic uh, and, and Muslim societies uh, were you know, similar to those that took place uh, in the Abbasid era and, 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 and other times as well. And they were not easy to understand, but they were, there was a large public which was present, which may have heard, may not have heard, but which in a sense gave a sense of uh, belonging to those debates. So what I've done is looked at some of these debates, actually one particular debate, which had eight uh, pamphlets written about it. I've only found eight, I think there may be more, uh, and how, how the oral and the written completely sort of talk about different, different notions altogether. And those who look at print know that there's a there's a term called the fixity of print. I mean, it's something that, that once print is written, that it becomes fixed. I, looking at different records, different, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, different records of the same event, oral event, you get a completely different uh, perspective depending on what who you're reading. If you look at the Hindus writing about a particular manazra, if you look at the Christians, if you look at the Muslims, you get a completely different, you have no sense of what's happening. So again, this is something that, that is particularly interesting that if you, if, uh, if you look at just one or two uh, accounts of an event, you get, a, you get a very different picture. Is that true or not? We don't know, we were not there. But it, it's interesting how 
the written tradition of events uh, from different sources gives you give you different meaning. For example, uh, in, in one manazra, there's uh, the, uh, the, the leader of the, the Deoband school is supposed to have spoken for an hour and a half when you were only allowed to speak for five minutes, but it's supposed to have spoken for an hour and a half. That hour and a half gets five lines in the Hindu uh, pamphlet that's written by the Hindu, by the Arya Samaj. Uh, and uh, in, in the Urdu uh, uh, pamphlets, you get about 38 pages of that of that talk taking place where you get a complete silence of all other communities so it's very interesting who you read what you read so i found this this relationship between uh, the oral and the written particularly important for trying to study history and again looking at how uh, historians look at that period so finally i'll just end and say that you know uh, what i did was i looked at different sources in the archive and very different sources i think uh, a lot of the material that I looked at had not been seen by a lot of scholars, and, on, and I know now it's much easier to get uh, get, get get publications work uh, on the internet and in libraries than 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So I had that advantage. Also, using um, Urdu is, I think, particularly useful if you're looking at the Muslims in South Asia. I, I, I'm completely, you know surprised shocked at how some scholars make very profound statements without looking at the writings of scholars of that time based on the colonial record and sometimes they're completely uh, way off target so one of the so the key argument of my book is that it contests the general narrative of lamentation decline self-pity and ruination and I propose a very different uh, mechanism which is of zillat that you know utter humiliation how that gives rise to a sense of self-reflection, self-motivation, and allows Muslims to emerge from whatever shock that they may have uh, witnessed. Uh, the second is that I look at, uh, I, I get a sense that uh, there's no real community in the way some scholars have imagined a Muslim community to exist sometime in the 19th century. I don't get that sense. I know that there are Muslims of different types. There's a recognition of who Muslims are, uh, but there's no, there's no sense of community. And this is something that uh, you know, sociologists and anthropologists can debate of what is a community, when does it form, how does one create one, why am I making the claim that, uh, so I, 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 I said there's a sense of identity, but not a sense of community, and I think I distinguish between the two, that you can identify with, with, some, with someone who belongs, belongs in some way, in a similar but different sense of the same broad religion, but does that create a community, that's something that perhaps, you know, is worth, worth talking about. Uh, I also say that, uh, the, the rise of the ulema in some ways displaces uh, the Muslim sovereign uh, and allows for identities of a different kind of, of, of a hierarchy to take place. Uh, I know we always say that there's no church in Islam, but I've always been a little, um, uh, I also look, looked at that, that, that phrase differently. And I said that while there are hierarchies in the sense of material that is produced by the ulema, by which is followed by fatwas that take place. So there is at least, if not a hierarchy in, in, in the Christian world sense, there is a, a sense of, of learning, of, of authority, which, 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 which uh, you know, the lay people follow. So maybe not a church, but at least there is that line of reasoning, understanding, and, and, and how that is filtered down into, into the, the general, uh, the Muslim uh, public. Uh, and that gives rise to, I think, this differentiation that takes place. One of the things that I try to look through in, in the material that I read is that how does anyone decide to identify as a Barelvi or a Diobandi or an El Hadith or an Ahmadi or I, I, something that I've not been able to, to, to find? How is it that this conscious decision is taken? What is it that at a time when you don't have these Muslims, you have the Al Islam, you have the different silsilas of, 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 uh, of the saints and, and others, but you don't have what I call institutionalized Islam. I mean, I call the, the, the Muslims that emerge uh, after the 1860s and after the 1870s, a very corporatized, very institutionalized forms of Islam. So how is it that the individuals, even those who are well-read, what is it that, that makes them decide that I am a Diobandi, I am a Barelvi, I, am an, I belong to the early Hadiths or to the Ahmadis? I, I, how that conscious decision takes place? This is something that I was not able to do. So I'll end there and say that, you know, this, this, this book is, uh, 
is is is, is uh, uh, tries to understand what was happening with uh, who we call the Muslim in the 19th century, and who called themselves the Muslim, and how that term, how that 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 sense of being contradicted other senses of being of the Muslim, and whether there was a sense of community. And I think that this question is important because uh, my sort of my sense is that the Muslim community emerges in the 20th century, not in the 19th century. It emerges after, say, 1906, after 1905, after the partition of Bengal, after, after the Khilafat movement, after the formation of the Muslim League, uh, so, and it become the political category rather than the religious one. Uh, so a lot of scholars have looked at the, the creation of a Muslim community on the basis of religious difference. Uh, I, I, I'll end with the last point saying that in the literature that I've looked at, it's, it's interesting that the Hindus and the Christians do not appear. It's only Muslims talking about themselves. So they're always critiquing, critiquing, critiquing themselves, whether it's the Barilis and the Deobandis, the Deobandis and the Eliadis, or the Shia and the Sunni and, and the Ahmadis and so forth. It's, it's, it's the large Muslims, I won't call them the community, the large number, large different, different groups of Muslims talking about themselves. So the, the, the other is themselves rather than the other is the other. I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think as a moderator, I'll open the floor, but as you reflect on your questions, I can maybe begin to reflect on, on or try to form some ideas here. Uh, it's a very rich book. Thank you for writing it. I really enjoyed reading it. And I uh, even, I'm even more, uh, more intrigued and, and uh, have all kinds of ideas percolating in my mind following your, your discussion. So I think I, I'll begin with where you ended. I want to ask a question uh, about about loose identities, right? Uh, I think I do agree that in the early 20th century, 1905, 1906, and so on, that Muslim identity is politicized, and, and through that we get the, the hard formed identities that we get in South Asia, especially Sunni sectarian identities. They are indeed around these uh, different forms of institutions. Uh, they don't reflect earlier practices of learning, for example, and earlier practices of uh, hierarchies and production of knowledge. With Deoband, for example, and Nadwat al Ulama, and so on. But the earlier period before that, right, the period before that in the you know, late uh, 18th and the first part, part of 19th century, there are some, some forms of coalescence that are trans regional and that they're present in South Asia. So, one of the things that you know, Sherani Alitarin has written about, of course, but which had been on my mind for some years, is that I came across a correspondence, um, in fact, I think in a preserved in Tonk in Rajasthan between Qazia Khairabadi and Saduddin Azurda on the question that Tareen takes up in, in his book. And it's about, uh, you know, the, it's a dual question of whether there could be another Muhammad and whether yeah. God is capable mm -hmm. of lying. Mm -hmm. And in that particular discourse, I, I noticed a couple of things. One of them is that there is a kind of scholarly coalescence with one part, Qazia Khairabadi and his group, uh, his students and those scholars associated with his lineage. And it's a lineage that is extending from him uh, and his group outside of South Asia, following a transtextual tradition going into Shiraz, northward into other areas. And then through this, that transtextual tradition, they're picking up specific theological positions to argue their point. Right? So it's a sort of a transregional loose scholarly identity that one can sort of pin down even in that early period. And on the other hand, yeah, these, these figures seem to have certain specific administrative posts that they have, like their Sadr Sudur and their Sarir Shidar and so on and so forth in India. And they're corresponding uh, sometimes across time uh, and also region, but sometimes in that time uh, across regions uh, on these issues. Uh, these same scholars uh, being often in the service either of the British or the, or, or the Mughals uh, tend also to write tracts against the Wahhabis. Uh, and the other side is precisely what I've described. There are scholars who have some kind of a loose lineage uh, through Shaukani and through others into Hijaz, to some extent have some reflections that seem to be Wahhabi in their inspiration, though they don't call themselves Wahhabi, they actually deny that they're Wahhabis. Um, and they have a different theological position on these, on these matters, on these legal and, and these pressing finer points of argument that you find in the, in the confession. Somewhere along the way, uh, through a process that's not clear to me, 
uh, these loose groups uh, of scholars and networks emerged as the Deobandis and the Barilis. Barilis actually seem to emerge through some lineage that goes through Badayun, where they have still a very strong uh, presence also among Kherabadi scholars. So I, 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 I'm trying to understand how that coalescence, scholarly, transregional, transtextual coalescence was deployed and instrumentalized in the colonial political moment. Uh, perhaps, and I don't know that story, to produce these maslaks at the end of the day. Um, are certain categories being uh, reimagined? Uh, is, that, is that a category that's being reimagined in the process of this formation? Uh, is the notion of a watan being instrumentalized somehow? To whom does the watan belong? Um, because watan, in many ways, in, before this period in the literature, is more a place of longing as opposed to a place of belonging. Right? It's a, it's, it's that what you aspire for and that, that kind of memory and nostalgia that you uh, bear in your heart as opposed to forming a national boundary. So our, in the formation, this process of this formation from these loose scholarly networks that are debating through the Munazara and ultimately forming these identities that are more hard, uh, are certain concepts being instrumentalized? Are the British instrumentalizing these Munazara to produce these outcomes are Muslims themselves instrumentalizing them and retrans, you know, and transforming these concepts and categories, eventually to emerge as sort of a political Muslim identity. By the time we get to the early twentieth century, so that's a, that's the point that's not clear to me. Yeah. I don't know that process, but maybe not even to mind. me. I, I I I would confess not even to me, but you know, I you can't one can't deny the fact that there is uh, there's bound to be continuity. When I say bound to, that means I'm not saying there is. There's bound to be continuity <clears throat> in ideas which 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 have started from Shah Waliullah and prior to that, and then been conveyed. I think uh, Shah Waliullah and Shah Ahmed Aziz, Abdul Aziz are, are referred to by all scholars of Islam, uh, the Obandi tradition, uh, the Barelbi tradition. So there's there's a sense of that. But I, you know, I one of the things that I find, uh, not to answer to your, not answer your question directly, I find that there's a complete absence of maybe a thousand years of uh, thinking about Islam and Islamic theology in the South Asian context. There is, you know, there is, you, you go back to the very earlier period of the Sahaba, uh, and then uh, maybe up to Ghazali. And after that, there's, there's an absence. I mean, South Asian Islam, but however it is in, in, Mughal, in, in the Mughal period and before that, uh, does not seem to be referred to by the scholars that I've looked at. Uh, so there's a, there's a gap. So when we talk about you know, how the ideas in, in the late uh, 19th century uh, were, 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 were cultivated in previous centuries, I mean, there seems to be, when does one start? Is it 1788, for example, 1820? When does that, when does that sort of moment when there's a, a rethinking about uh, South Asian Islam emerge which takes us to the end of the 19th century, because I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely not familiar with what happened before the 19th century in terms of South Asian Islam. But in the, in the material that I've looked at in the 19th century, one doesn't get any reference to that period. So and, and then it's always going back to the Hejaz and to the time of the prophet. So there's 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 a millennium missing in that thing, uh, in, in that uh, that way of thinking. So. Again, to come back to your question, where does Khairabadi come from in the sense that where does his sense of learning, understanding, uh, his, his theology come from? What is, the, what is the basis of that? Where does that start from? And how is that transmitted towards the 19th century? I think you're right that there is that, that sense of continuation. But before that, I don't know where it, how it emerges. Um, then. I know that uh, there is this sense that you know there is a precursor to the Deoband school and the 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 uh, Barelvi school in the ninth, in the late eighteenth century, early yeah early nineteenth century, and that's how this is formed. I I don't know whether there's a leap of faith. Uh, I haven't seen the continuity. Uh, maybe there isn't one. So is there a is it truncated? Uh, is there a line that one can draw? Is that one can say it's broken in many places, but you can find the same debates, but you can find the same debates in the third century as well. 
You can find the same debates in eighth century as well. You can find similar debates in the 19th century, in the 14th century, 13th century as well. So I, I one of the one of the things that interested me in trying in starting this work was to I didn't to look at exactly this question. Why do so many Muslims emerge in a particular region in the UP, what is today the UP? Literally, Deoband, uh, uh, the, the, these, these towns are a few hours away today. And why does it emerge there? What is that? Is it, is it because of the colonial experience uh, is, that happened? But you have other faiths in Islam emerging in other places as well. So I have not been able to answer that. So I'm not sure how to you know, I mean, respond. One specific example is, in fact, the Ahl Hadith, right? You can trace the lineage all the way to the Quranis. And which is specifically tied to the, the Ibn Abdul Wahhab. And of course, in the late 19th century, as Martin Reed Singer has shown us in the late 19th and early 20th century, we have the continuity of the same kinds of debates now happening in an inter-confessional space, as you were talking about. So again, what I'm curious about is that, again, this diachronic development uh, from somebody like uh, Amrit Sari that Martin Reed Singer talks about, all the way to the Quranis who are actually in the Hijaz and the Ottoman realms and so on. What, again, what I'm curious about is that although there is a theological and transsexual continuity, even in that case, in the other Hadith, it does break off and become something else. And I think that's the question that we're both confused about, right? Because what are the processes through which that formation, which has a continuity, is becoming specific to South Asia? Um, and I suppose, I mean, I, I don't have any answers. I'm curious about, are they instrumentalizing certain notions like Qaum? What happens to uh -huh. Qaum in Urdu? Uh -huh. It has a very different... Persian and Arabic presence. What happens with takfir? How is takfir being discussed in these texts? So coming back to both al Hadith and to the Qom, uh, the al Hadith vehemently deny that they have anything to do with the Hijaz. Yeah, they absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And they even say, you know, that they say that there is not a single book which has which has come from the Hijaz which talks about our Islam. They they look at it. I mean, this is this is interesting. They look at very local signs of 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 Muslim men wearing uh, their, you know, shalwar or whatever it is, to how high it, that is, what their beard is like, uh, and and they make a very, very, very clear point that if you go to Bombay, the al hadith are these, and very localized. If you, for example, they they'll say those who go to the shrine are not al hadith, those who do are, uh, so vice versa. Uh, and if you, and, and certain practice is very, very highly localized, and. Of course, it's understandable why they're denying any sense of continuity or even reference to the Wahhabis and Hijaz because of the British, because of the seditious nature. But I, I, I would still say, of course, you cannot. I mean, of course, Islam. You cannot just deny the fact that there is a, a very general uh, sense of what Islam is and parts of what whatever Islam was, whenever it was, and whenever it is, is transfer to different regions, areas, people who develop it differently. So there, there are, there are what, what one would call continuities, generalities, of course, practices and so on and so forth, uh, particular essence of the faith. But I think that it's in you know, the sense of um, how, how a local condition gives rise to very particular senses of identity within Sunni Islam is also very important. And what is continuous and what is uh, imagine new is something that we have to look for. So coming back to the qom, I the qom is is a term which becomes very popularized by uh, someone who is not a religious, uh, who does not belong to uh, a, re a religious maslak like Sir Sayyid Ahmed especially. I mean, he uses the word qom and it becomes a very normalized sense of the Muslim, North Indian Muslim identity, not an Islamic identity not as a Muslim identity alone, because he's very ambiguous about this notion. Sometimes he says the Hindus and the Muslims are both one qom, they're part of one qom. Sometimes he says only the North Indian Muslims are a qom and the Bengali Muslims are not a qom. So there are those you know, contradictory notions of, of uh, in, in his statements. But I don't see the qom in Urdu, at least, uh, being reflected in the writings of Muslim, of Islamic scholars as much as I do in those who are talking about uh, broader senses of identifying people as opposed to based on you know, religious ideas, like the, 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 the Muslims that we are talking about. I don't see the word qom emerging in their writing as much as I do in those who are not writing about particular Muslims. 
I mean, in, in, in the Arabic and Persian, it indeed is a broader term, right? Um, it's a vague enough term to refer to a large group of people, and they, they may not even belong to the same religion. So in, there it seems to be quite uh, similar in the Urdu literature. I'm wondering if it's being paired with other, uh, with other concepts to produce some specificity mm -hmm. in the Urdu. What then is what then is one's palm being defined in terms of a region that's being occupied? Uh, Unless a button is very large, mm. only then you can have a comb is much bigger than a button. Right. So yes, yeah, so is being is it being specified in terms of um... so so the, the the Hindustani the North Indian Muslim is what is usually referred to in the comb in the literature in in Urdu, uh, and that excludes all other Muslims in South Asia from the Bengalis to 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 South of India elsewhere the Punjabis they're not considered part of the comb. Uh, so it's, I'll ask one last question yeah. and I'll open it to, because this is fascinating and we're going to have dinner too, so I'll keep asking. But what I wanted to ask is, I mean, of course, the case of al is clear. They vehemently deny, deny any association with the Wahhabi tradition, although you can actually track it in various ways back to that moment. And if not to Wahhabis, then certainly to those who studied in the same lineage like Shaukani and so on. So that it's, it's, they're protesting too much, which in the late 19th century, and it's rather obvious. There's also all these massive numbers of tracts, of course, anti-Wahhabi tracts being written in South Asia. So that I, I can sort and of- And the understand. trials as well, the, 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 yeah, 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 the Patna trials. And what about the Deobandis and Barelis? Are they also con consciously identifying themselves at particular moments like the Wahhabis under certain kinds of political pressures to form I an identity and break off from the larger continuities, transregional and diachronic? Or uh, have you read in your, in your readings? Uh, I, I can't answer that, I'm not sure whether there's a you know the i think perhaps there's more of a localized understanding of what sunni islam is uh because i i don't see many of the scholars of the 1870s 80s 90s having the same sort of links with transregional uh sort of traveling as much as they did i know that no, not we went for one Hajj. I, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if Ahmed Raza Khan Barilbi went for a Hajj or not. I'm sure he must have. I, 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 I forget what they did. But I, other than that, one doesn't see the sort of, you know, in some ways, the, the, the earlier era, late 18th century, early 19th century, was more transregional, oddly enough, in a sense, because there was, uh, you know, in, in, and I think that if, if that's so, I would say that that was because of the, the nature of the institutionalized nature of Sunni Islam in the late 19th century required scholars to be more um, immediate in a sense, more present in their local context in terms of responding. So it, it became perhaps less scholarly in a way and more uh, of a day-to-day -day nature. You know, how does one respond to, is this allowed or is that not allowed? So for example, the fatwa writing that takes place, a huge, I mean, the, 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 the hundreds of thousands of fatwa, which are written by both the Barelbi school and the Deoband school, uh, they deal with absolutely day-to-day -day issues. And I think that whole industry that takes place is very different from the, the sort of the free-flowing, the open, the almost, you know, unencumbered nature of Islamic formation or theology, which takes place earlier. But that's a partial explanation. Well, I very much look forward to continuing this, but I shouldn't monopolize. There's so many more people here and online, I'm sure. Oh, the floor is open. I, I've been talking too much. So Shiraz, please. I have a question. So where do you take the first Sunni texts that you've done? Um, and all these moving parts that I think that those who are interested in the field can, you know, pick up on and produce the second work. Um, I was wondering about whether uh, you also, going beyond the scope of the book and, and the sort of inquiry that you pursue, do you also situate India in a, uh, or South Asia in a sort of distinct uh, place, in, you know, in a sort of transnational context, transregional context? Uh, we know that, for example, a bit later than the material that you put at, people like, for example, Azad or Iqbal, uh, you know, they're going to think about South Asia and the Muslim tradition in South Asia as something distinct in, you know, compared to how it is in the rest of the Muslim world. And oftentimes that entails 
you know, very interesting interpretations of the Muslim past. So for example, they would compare India to Al Andalus, for example. They'll say that you know India is this, the only thing comparable in the contemporary Islamic world to Al Andalus is India, and that Muslims are you know they represent a vibrant culture but are a minority, so they distinct they face different kinds of challenges. So have you thought about that? Just kind of uh, I was wondering if you have know, juxtaposed India during that period with what's going on in Egypt or, or Turkey or Iran? No, I haven't. Uh... And that's something that I'm more interested in now, having put this aside and I want to think of those things. So there, there's a term which emerges, which you didn't mention at all. Uh, you mentioned Qom, the Ummah, for example. Uh, and that is, again, something that I, I think that, again, that emerges after the Khilafat movement, when it becomes a political category. So before that, it becomes, you know, the, in a very broad, very, very, I think, open-ended sense of, uh, identity with other Muslims, but it's, it's nothing beyond that. Because I, I'll come to what Shiraz, Shiraz's question, but, but I, I, I think beyond that, it, it doesn't signify very much, and it's a very loose sort of notion. There, there are scholars who write about uh, a universal Islamism. I don't find that sense in the 19th century. Again, 20th century is different. I think there is a marked difference there in the, in the people that you're talking about, Azad and especially Iqbal. Uh, and that's and one can understand why they're looking, looking back in a very different sense. Although Noman, Shibli Nomani also does something similar, but the other the, the, the scholars do not do that. The Islamic scholars don't do that. And Shibli Nomani is not is Islamic scholar in the same way as uh, Ahmad Rada Barelvi or Nanatvi or Gangohi and things like this. He's not a, a, a theologian of that of that nature. So I I, I think that. Um, this and Jamaluddin Afghani, I'm not impressed with at all in the sense that people consider him to be, you know, somebody who's, who's traveled the world and Sir Sayyid has one exchange with him and therefore we, you know, there's, there's a universalism uh, and about the Islamic world. I, I, I think that's that's a hoax, com complete hoax. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit because I know scholars work on these things, but I, 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 I'm not impressed with the exchange that takes place there. And I think that if that's the only exchange that, that emphasizes the point, I don't see uh, a, a sort of a trans-regional sense of identity uh, amongst the Islamic scholars and Muslims of that of the 19th century, of the, you know, from up to about 1880, 1890, except Sayyid Ahmed Khan, who just talks about Cambridge and Oxford and wants, so it's a very different sense of identity where he wants to create the Muslim form in a very different sense. So it's understandable why uh, Iqbal would do what he did. He spends his formative years in Germany, uh, and you know he, he he comes to to England as well. And I think that uh, the sense of Andalus or Cordoba and Granada, I mean, this this is a very late uh, stage when th these identities emerge. Uh, one one of the things I critique in this uh, is, is as well this notion of pan-Islamism. I don't buy it at all. There's no pan-Islamism in the 19th century. You know, just because you have reports of newspapers about what's happening in the Balkans or that uh, that there are people who are contributing money uh, for the Turco-Russian war, that is not pan-Islamism. That's, uh, that, that's I don't know what it is, but I I can't accept that as a notion of pan-Islamism the way I understand it. I think what Iqbal does is he does bring pan-Islamism into it, both historically, both in terms of space and time. And uh, so that, that's something very, that happens very much later. So that's, something, that's an era I don't look at, but I don't see this similar, I won't even say the same, a similar sense of connectivity with the outside world. Uh, I, uh, in, in, in 1880s onwards, except, as I said, Sayyid Ahmed Khan and some travelers who go to, to Europe or who go to Sham and, you know, Iraq and, uh, you know, places, Egypt and places like that. But that's also, uh, it's a different type of travel law. It's not the same. I, I, I wonder, that's actually a very interesting question, whether Andalus and, uh, you know, uh, that era, whether that emerges in the writing. A, 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 of an earlier era, in the 1880s and 1890s. If one looks at Avad, Avad Panch and Avad Akbar, you get references to that. You get references to Cyprus, you get references to different, different, different locations, but not in the sense that Iqbal and others bring it, bring, bring it about. 
So Abu for the sake of clarity, when you say that there is no transfusional identity, uh, I, that's, that's you, an exaggeration. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a clarification so that we can be all clear. Yeah. You, you, when you say that, I imagine you mean that there's no transfusional broad Muslim shared identity, right? Of course, because there are of course authors from the earlier period like Shahbu Aziz, for example, where it's the Tuhfa, and in that text when he is undermining you know, challenging or and so on, whatever word you want to use, the, the Shia tradition, he's looking very broadly, not just within the Indian white community, but he's looking very broadly at the Shia tradition. And, and you know, his attack is actually directed at certainly Shia scholars like Dindar Ali, but mm -hmm. they themselves have a transfusional mm -hmm. textual presence. So um, are you comfortable, for example, in saying that there is a transfusional focal identity uh, meaning, let's say, an emerging Shia identity yes. that's transregional or emerging. Yes, so, I, okay. I just I, wanted to no, in, in the Shia tradition, I would, I think there's a far greater sort of uh, scope in terms of uh, extending beyond whatever we call India at that time. I think that's very, that's very obvious, and I think that that tradition it goes back a few hundred years. Not, it's not just the 19th century. It goes back since Humayun's time, and you see the presence of uh, Persian and Persian scholars and Shia Islam in, uh, in in North India, and I think that's uh, that's very important. And you see it in Avad as well. So there is uh, there is that that very it jumps across any border that you could have, but not in the Sunni tradition as much. Right. In the Sunni tradition, I would, I mean, I'll have to think more about it, but I think there is such a thing when it comes to what I keep, keep calling transtextual identity, right? The points of reference, for example, the, the, the theological dispensation of the Barilis, the Mawakad, for example, is effectively an attack on the Wahhabi tradition of Arabia. Mm -hmm. Now, this is so Sunnism asserting itself and its identity against another part of the Sunni tradition in South Asia by referring to texts and traditions that lie outside technically of South Asia. So in that sense, there is a transtextual tradition that is available, but you're right. I mean, there is an internal discourse and internal dialectic that's shaping these sort of local identities or more than local, but I would say sort of focal identities in South Asia. Um, it seems even among the Sunnis, especially among people who are from the lineage, not just Khairabadis mm -hmm. and so on, but also among the lineage of, especially among the lineage of Shah Abdul Aziz. Uh, you know, they are rather committed to the, the works of Shao Kani, for example. Um, and of course, we have South Asian scholars like Zabili and others who actually write, you know, these important lex lexicons, that which then spread through Yemen and to the Hijaz. So, and they're writing in Arabic also. I, mean, they're writing what, in Arabic, I think that's, uh, that's yeah. I would say that's, that's in some ways crossing borders already. Yeah. That why, who's going to read the Arabic, you right. know, unless it's for, for an audience which is wider. And the other thing is, they often go to the Hejaz to get a sense of uh, authority. The you know the the what are the mohars uh, that they call stamps. stamps. Yeah, so I think there's another word for it. But to get those stamps to endorse, to get a sense of hijaza. Uh, okay, so, so, so the, that sense of uh, authority in their ideas and to denounce the barrieries or the deobandis, whoever happens to be there. So there is. I, I think there is that sense of authority lying there, but I, I I think that it does become the debates do become very sort of you know uh, almost incestuous if one can use yeah, that sure. word rather than uh, because their their immediate concern is okay what is the flock how big is the flock are they going to go towards the Barelvis, the LNDs or, or the Deobandis? So it's, I I whoever I am needs to create my community of the, my people within this people. So referring to, so this, 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 uh, this historical legacy, I think becomes less important and it becomes more immediate to debate what the Diobandis are saying or so-and-so is saying rather than so more theor uh, theological arguments. So I think that progress needs to be tracked. Yeah. At what point does it become an internal dialectic? Yeah. In my work on logic, you know, much of the material comes, Shirad and my scholar, uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, no, uh, from outside of South Asia, and then after a little while, it becomes its own internal, uh, has its own internal motion. But I, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know whether I should ask, yeah. does much of this, the, the debates, which, which are very particular to South Asia, do they trans, do they travel they elsewhere? They don't go out. In, in the work that I do, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm curious about the same thing. But there is, there is an intake, and the intake continues for a while, and then there's an internal textual tradition that allows you to go back as needed and does it through hints and prompts and so on.
but the, the, the motion is internal, right? There's mm -hmm. a, what you call incestual and what I might call an internal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's a certain moment with certain gateway commentaries and, and figures and texts after which the doors, the, the dialectic is internal. It does produce possibilities and, and does curate the return to a textual archeology span outside of the region. Um, but it's motivated by internal you know, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and, I, and I wonder if the similar kind of chronology can be constructed for the questions that you're raising about identity, right? At what at certain point, there must be an intake and, and the debate and discussion is trans-regional, let's say among the Sunnis and, and South Asian, Wahhabis outside and so on. And then somewhere along the way, it must coalesce into an internal dialectic. And that would be interesting to see. But, but do you, when you said, uh, we, we can continue talking, but when you said yeah. the early Hadiths, uh, do you call them? Would you consider them to be? I would. So, so do they? Do they follow the lineage of what you would call Saudi, the, the Wahhabi uh, religion or thought of that time? Or do you think that because they, they, I, mean, I I've looked at the al Hadith literature, and perhaps the debates are similar, but I don't get the sense of um, relationship. Which, which, which from the Hejaz. I don't get the sense of what and how and what's the channel of, of communication. Yeah, there's an actual many, many years ago, it's been a decade and a half, and I must, I have forgotten, I did actually draw, as I often do, my students know, a network <laughs> chart. And you can, in fact, tra tra trace the scholarly networks from disciple to master and so on, all the way into uh, parts of it, into Yemen and parts into Hejaz and so on. Now, as I'm saying, at some point, it does get closed off. And in fact, they become, mm -hmm. as you were saying, rather adamant in denying that lineage. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a story that's fascinating to me and the motivations for it, and I know nothing about it. But, mm -hmm. but you can actually tra trace a master-disciple relationship mm -hmm. all the way back to the Qur'ans. Mm -hmm. So any, any other questions? Uh, please, sir. I apologize for my lack of knowledge of the history, but you started the speech in the mid-1800s, two events. 1857, that was support of rebellion, I assume. 1858, a conversion of governance from commercial to colonial. Why would that humiliate the Muslim inhabitants? What was the effect of that humiliation? And did it have any kind of future effect on their relationship to the Raj? Okay, very good questions. Uh, the reason why they do suffer that humiliation is that they thought that for 500 years, 400 years, they ruled what we call India. The Mughal, the Mughal and, pre, and the Delhi Sultanate on was that there was a sense of Muslim uh, rulership yeah. of, of India. So when that power is taken away, although it, 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 it had completely dissipated, when that power is formally taken away, there is a sense of, you know, that we are, uh, I mean, in fact, they even said that we are fatherless. We are without a sovereign. We are without a leader. We are we are we are just children without without a family of, you know, of that sort. So there is that sense of when power being taken away because there's this idea of you know a question similar question which is asked. Okay, why does this not happen in other, you know in other in, in, in Persia for example? Manakia's work, uh, a recent book, also talks about how this 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 sense of zilla to shame takes place. But the reason why I emphasize it in South Asia is that when you've had a, a symbolic entity called the, the Muslim or Muslims or whatever you want to call them for, for so many centuries and when they're formally taken away, they, you, you, get, you get a very different uh, sense of loss that you do in, in, other, in, other, in other countries. So that's the first. The second is um, they negotiated with the Raj and many of them became uh, started working for, for the British Raj. Others, the, the Muslim scholars, for example, they, they set up their own institutions uh, where they began to think about the, the Islamic faith, theology, practice. And so they, they, they differentiated themselves from many who joined government service, joined the British and so on and so forth. Okay, so, okay that makes sense to me. I couldn't understand it. But what, what you're saying is that up until that time, there was a semblance of um, Muslim hegemony in the area, even with the Raj, would not the Raj, but with the British East India Company there, there was a commercial venture, we are still the rulers. Yeah. And all of a sudden the curtain comes down and no, you're not. Yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Nadia? Yes, uh, 
Thank you, thank you, Dr. Daddy. I think this is, this is very fascinating. Um, my question is, is twofold. Um, in the first, as you said, I think this is very true. As you said, once the structure of the of, of the Mughal state is wrong, um, the position of the ulama, right, and who they are and what they're supposed to do, right, as you said, kind of pushing them to this political arena almost, right, and they are doing and engaging in an activity which, of course, we who work on the pre-modern period, we really cannot reconcile, or at least we have a lot of trouble trying to understand that with, you know, what we consider that landscape uh, to look like, at least. So, uh, my question is in terms of, as you said, you are trying to connect this notion of zillah that you have uh, with this uh, question of Muslim identity form. And, of course, as you said, the census also makes Muslim um, a legal category, right? So, in the literature that you're looking at, do you see, since there's so much infighting, firstly, do you think that this translates electorally? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this kind of classification of Deo and Rebe and all of that. Do you see, of course, like I said, now the ulama are in a different place and they are trying to, as you say, almost like trying to forge these small, like, you know, niche, niches that they have, which kind of they control. But I'm, I'm thinking of, since you think it's a local affair, do you think that it also has a broader architectonics, which then, of course, affects at some national level and translates to some kind of electoral presence, which will, of course, give it a very different tenor. That's the first question. And the second question is the question of language. Mm -hmm. As you say, with this increased activity, right, predominantly in Urdu, uh, do you think that this has implications on the Hindi-Urdu question? Uh, and, and, like, you know, there's, of course, this later classification to Urdu as the Muslim language. Right, and more importantly, the broader spread of Urdu, right, uh, within this field, because as you know, of course, like, uh, my understanding is that it's precisely this nature of now Urdu being that scholarly vehicle, which makes it very much prone to becoming that language almost which can inherit what Persian is in the prior context. So, so the answer to your question is yes, obviously. Second one, yes, obviously, but with, with some clarification. It's also uh, the, the, the what's called the Urdu Hindi controversy starts in the 1860s, 1870s, and uh, in some ways, you know, it, it, it represents uh, what today one would call a democratization of language, if you wish. I mean, the, you must, we, we, I mean, we, we must realize that Persian was hegemonic in, in, in even at that time, because it was spoken by few, written by few, uh, and it was a court language, and which after 1849, I think, when the British make Urdu the official language, that again, because it follows from that trajectory, it's already embedded in an, a notion of Islamic, Arabic, Persian, Urdu. So there is that 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 sense about it. Whether it's true or not is besides the point. There's a sense about it, and because the script is, you see, it's it's, it's very interesting whether the Urdu Hindi divide is about language or is about the script, and and that itself is a fascinating debate. And there've been a couple of very Christopher King and others have written very very extensively on this, that, you know, why does the Hindu, Hindu Muslim divide not take place in Bengali, for example, it's one language, one text, one, one script, it only takes place in the Hindi heartland, or the Urdu heartland between uh, Urdu and, and, and Hindi, and it's because of the script, not because of the language, something that, you know, we, we, we call it language, but it's actually, I think it's, it's script. And that has, has connotations, which, which emanate from Arabic, Islam, Persian, because that's the nature of script which 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 Urdu follows. Uh, so um, and also there's, there's there's in the 1860s and 70s there's just as there's a, one of the things that I don't talk at all about is that there's a Hindu revivalist movement as well. So Hindu Hindi revivalist movement which emerges, you know, with uh, the Banaras Hindu uh, College and others, the language movement that takes place amongst the the the, the Ashraf amongst the Hindus as well. And for them, Hindi and Sanskrit become uh, sacred languages, at least say, uh, Sanskrit does. So the Urdu and Hindi need to be seen by two opposing uh, groups, if you wish to, it's not just language, it's the, the communities who support that language and the tussle between the two communities. I think that that's what follows. Uh, the answer to your first question is Venka Dhulipala. Uh, if you read his uh, book, uh, it's essentially about, a lot of people don't like his book, but uh, <laughs> Shiraz is laughing. Uh, but if you read his book, that gives you a sense of how uh, these religious 
identities, muslaks translated into uh, political uh, movements. But I, I, I think that doesn't happen. Obviously, it doesn't happen till again, 1905, 96. I think there, there, is, there are some turning points, the, the making of the Muslim League, partition of Bengal, the Khilafat movement, uh, Mr. Jinnah earlier on. Uh, you know, so there, is, there are those, those elements, uh, the Khan, those elements which, which start giving a Muslim community a political identity. And then it becomes about representation. So uh, the, the electoral uh, repercussions of the Muslims take place much later, 1830s, 40s, and 50s, uh, 1930s, 40s, and 50s, not earlier. I mean, you don't find the Muslims representative in the legislative, uh, you know, uh, legislative assemblies or whatever they were called of the viceroy. They are they they are people who are uh, supposed to be who don't represent uh, theological discourse. But Sayyid Ahmad Khan is there, but he doesn't, he's there as an eminent Muslim from Aligarh rather than uh, as, as a the theologian. And I think also the, the, both the Barelvi school and the, and, and the Deoband school, uh, they sort of distance themselves from these, these forms of politics, I think, uh, and engaging with the British. They, their, their main uh, sort of, uh, field is other Muslims. And they want to, as you said, I think what Shiraz said, they want to, to, to create a following, you said, to create a following rather than get a formal type of representation. For them, formal representation is not important. It's whether you belong to their maslak, which is more important. Well, we'll take one more. Oh, please. Um, thank you. Thank you, Arjun, for this. I have a question that's about sort of the implications of the list or change over this 19th into the 20th century. So you were sort of helpful in pointing out for us that it's kind of not helpful for the going to go backwards from 1947 and think, well, this is how Pakistan comes into being. But is there something about the sort of idea of shame sort of uh, as, as an affect that is a driving force for, as you're saying, Muslim constitutions of self, but also then like a national identity? Like what does it mean for a country like Pakistan to be born as a gift of a shame rather than a pride, which is the, the opposite sort of you know emotion that I use? I think about this a lot too, because it's like it seems like what we seem to be obsessed with even at a contemporary moment is sort of like shame as this operating force on every day, except as being a way to regain sort of some some essential shame that we're continuing. Your yeah, so I, I, I think this idea of zillat or shame, whatever, humiliation, I think shame is, is, is too soft to word. I think humiliation uh, in some ways is lost and, and, and it's dealt with when Iqbal emerges, exactly that. I mean, when he brings a sense of a very strong identity amongst the North Indian Muslims in, in Hindustan, I think you get, you get that sense of who we are and who we can become and what we were. I think that that that's so, the, so I don't think that Pakistan emerges uh, out of a sense of shame or humiliation. I think it's a very powerful uh, emergence, although one can debate whether it's right or wrong or good or bad or something else. But I think it's a, it's a very powerful uh, sense, which, which sort of deals with, which, which in some ways comes to term with this notion of Zillat. I think Zillat is, is an early, say, if you're looking at, say, 1857 to 1947, if you look at that, those 90 years, I think Zillat plays a very important role earlier on, but because my argument, my speculative argument, is that gives account of Muslims emerging as uh, you know as as, a, as as different entities, and then eventually because of politics, because of whatever the colonial movement, that they emerge as a nation eventually, uh, and that too is you know what is what is a Muslim nation in South Asia. But I think that, that, that the notion of zillat is put aside. They've overcome that. And it's interesting that you raise that point. I mean, I was presenting uh, this argument of zillat last week at, in Karachi at the IBA. And there's a scholar from uh, Lums called Hassan Karar who works on China. And he said, you know, it's very interesting. Chinese had exactly the same problem. hundred, they've had a hundred years of shame. And look where they're, where they, and, and even today they manifest their idea of. 100 years of shame 
and who they are and where they want to be. So it does give rise to some sort of agentive a sense of identity and to come out of that shame to, to set the record straight and have a better future. So if Pakistan is the, 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 the outcome of, of Zillat, I'd, I'd rather keep quiet. I have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's that's ending on an optimistic note. That if that's what it is, then there's a bright future ahead. I want to thank you for, for coming all this way and for enlightening us and for engaging us. I know you're very tired. Um, I, uh, I want to th thank the audience for joining us here and also on Zoom. I forgot uh, to discharge an important duty to thank my, my colleague Neil Gully, who makes all of this possible behind the scenes. Uh, one often doesn't get to see him on, on, on camera, but I want to thank him as well. So thank you again for, thank for you. joining us. Thank uh, you very much. I look forward to hosting you again. And th thank you all. Thank you for being here, taking the trouble. <laughs>